In December, as civilian casualties escalated in Gaza, the South African government took a very dramatic step, presenting a petition at the world's highest court, the International Court of Justice, accusing Israel of genocide. And in January, in a remarkable ruling, the ICJ found it plausible that Israel's acts could indeed amount to genocide. Now, the Israelis, of course, and their allies in Washington and London have loudly denied that what's happening in Gaza is a genocide, and Israel has even accused South Africa of being the legal arm of Hamas. Nevertheless, the South African government has won plaudits across the world for its effort to hold Israel to account, and the face of that international effort is the country's foreign minister, Dr. Naledi Pandor. She joins me, she joins Zateo for our very first interview here in Washington, D.C. Minister, thank you for joining us on Zateo. Thank you very much for the opportunity. There are 192 member nations of the United Nations aside from Israel. Mm -hmm. Why was it South Africa that decided to bring this pretty historic, pretty monumental petition, genocide petition to the International Court of Justice? How did it all come about? Whose idea was it in South Africa to do this? I think it had to be South Africa, really, because uh, <clears throat> the only country uh, that has a similar experience to the Palestinian people and that has been uh, firmly attached to their struggle for freedom and uh, human rights is South Africa. We have a, a long association. I've been explaining while here uh, that our interest and concern about Palestine didn't begin on October 8th. And really, given um, our experience of international solidarity and support from almost the entire uh, world community, we felt that that support, that solidarity movement, that our leaders really sought uh, and initiated, placed an obligation uh, on us where there is uh, patent harm to actually try to do something. So uh, the initiator was the Minister of Justice, uh, but before him I had received many letters uh, from human rights uh, uh, lawyers and activists in South Africa including uh, eminent uh, uh, legal yeah. uh, professionals, all saying there's the convention you know, on genocide. Why don't you do something, South Africa? So on that note, your lawyers at the ICJ in The Hague put out a very detailed case mm -hmm. back in January. Uh, but just for the sake of our viewers watching at home, it's a big charge, the genocide charge. Just briefly, why do you believe Israel is guilty of genocide. It's, of course, a charge Israel denies, its allies, the United mm -hmm. States denies. Why do you believe, briefly, Israel is guilty of genocide? Well, firstly, um, the evidence, in our view, is very clear. Uh, if you look at the uh, Genocide Convention, uh, which was actually crafted post the Second World War, with particular reference to the experience of uh, Jewish people in Europe, and its uh, aspects detail, firstly, that there's a focus on a group with an intent to erase a group, that uh, the measures taken uh, by the aggressor uh, actually seek to ensure that there is no life and that uh, an entire group is eradicated. There's a very specific focus and a range of actions that all speak to leading to death. As you know, the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, your counterpart, called your ICJ petition meritless and galling. Uh, the White House National Security Council spokesman, John Kirby, called it meritless, counterproductive, completely without any basis in fact whatsoever. What is your response to the US government when you hear statements like that? Well, firstly, uh, one of the things uh, that I've been intrigued by uh, while being in government and politics is that all of us call for attachment uh, to a range of instruments uh, that are uh, set in place to protect uh, humanity. But the minute those instruments are utilized, uh, if it is against a friend, yeah. uh, then uh, we complain. But when it is uh, utilized uh, and directed at what we regard as an enemy, mm. then we appreciate yeah. Uh, the international instrument. This has been uh, one of the uh, reasons for us constantly referring to a double standard approach to uh, uh, international uh, frameworks. Um, so I would say, um, and this has been said to me even uh, by some of my colleagues who are foreign ministers, the very 
galling, counterproductive, etc. And uh, I've said to them, well, fortunately, what the United Nations system has created is a court with eminent uh, jurists within yeah. it. And it is their decision and judgment. Yeah. Uh, we weren't seeking the judgment of partners, of friends, of commentators. Uh, one colleague told me that uh, she has studied law. I congratulated her on that. However, she's not a judge of the International Court of Justice. It's their duty uh, both to scrutinize what we yeah. submit, what Israel submits, and make a judgment. And to be clear, the court has said it is plausible uh, mm -hmm. that Israel could be committing genocide. You mentioned America not liking you taking action against its friend. You are here in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. You've been having meetings on Capitol Hill. Are you worried at all about this bipartisan bill introduced in Congress last month, which calls for a full review of U.S. relations with South Africa and questions whether South Africa is engaged in activities that undermine U.S. national security and foreign policy, basically seeks to punish your country for going to the ICJ? But it's a bipartisan bill. Indeed it is, and uh, it will come, I suspect, before the uh, House. And I've been told by uh, public representatives that it does have a bipartisan support. So I think it would be most unfortunate if it has passed, and so part of my presence here is to affirm uh, the bilateral relationship between South Africa and the United States. I think these are two important democracies in their regions. And uh, it's important that they get on uh, uh, well. Uh, also, um, I believe that uh, to have South Africa as uh, an enemy, yeah. or to have a frosty relationship, will impact on the relationship with the entire African continent, because South Africa is so key uh, on the continent. So I'm really uh, seeking to advise uh, that we be calm and measured in our approach and look at ways in which uh, together we might be a better uh, force for good in the world. So if, as you say, and the South African government says, that Israel is guilty of genocide in Gaza, in your view, and the United States is funding Israel, arming Israel, protecting Israel from UN Security Council resolutions with its veto, is the United States government, is President Biden complicit in that genocide? Well, we tabled an allegation which has to be proved by the International Court of Justice. We've named Israel and mentioned Palestine and the Palestinian people. We've not named any other country, but the convention does indicate that parties implicated would also be identified by the court. So it's very important that we allow the legal process uh, to ensue. I'm not in a uh, business of naming uh, this one or the other. I really respect the processes and want them to be followed. But you do believe Israel is guilty of genocide? Indeed, we've said there is uh, strong evidence in our view. Yeah. And the court but you has won't to say that America it. is helping Israel no, with that I don't genocide? Think, uh, I don't think that's my business. I think the court must identify whether there are any others who may be complicit. I mean, you said last week you issued a call for South Africans to protest the war outside the embassies of the five primary supporters of Israel. Yes, indeed. Which five supporters? I believe protest is important. Uh, I think people do know who the five are. No, and, and they don't. Uh, they, <laughs> they, must, they, don't. They, they certainly do. If they I, don't, they I'm, must do I'm, their homework. I'm sure my mum doesn't who's, know who's if she's providing at home. arms. I bet who you are the, she does. Who are the five? I bet you your mum knows. Okay, let's go to the US. The UK, the US, UK, France, uh, Germany has been a very strong Germany, supporter. Uh, that's France, three. France four, and uh, others, uh, the European uh, Union okay. uh, in its collective. So I think. Uh, so you, you would know, like to see protests outside the, the EU know, embassy and those four how, embassies. How do you, how do you get change? Okay. And I wish I could be in Gaza and stand in front of a Palestinian family and be strong enough to protect them. I, that's what I wish I could do because I'm pained that I have to watch on TV essentially a murder uh, underway, and I am helpless and can do nothing. This was very much the experience we had under apartheid, and it was mass protest, mass struggle, which made a major contribution to indicating to the world that this could not go on any longer. So for us to be invisible in a massive human struggle where we know huge murder is underway, 
I think that is unacceptable and the world should be horrified. And having large protests with a million is insufficient. There has to be an ongoing campaign to say to the world, this can't be. I have to ask again one more time. You say a huge murder is underway. That's a big charge, genocide, murder. Mm -hmm. You say protest outside the US embassy because they are helping Israel. So is the United States then, according to the logic you're presenting, is the UK, is Germany, are they accomplices to that murder? Well, they're certainly supporting Israel uh, and have said so publicly. Only recently have they said Israel has a right to defend itself, but it must not harm innocent people. Unfortunately, when you have a bomb, uh, it's very difficult for the bomb to decide uh, who's innocent and who's guilty. They have these big dumb bombs that are killing more than just, uh, quote unquote, the terrorists. Um, in terms of stopping the killing, in its initial ruling in January, which you called a major victory, the ICJ agreed that it is plausible that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza, ordered Israel to take immediate and effective measures to increase humanitarian aid and take all measures within its power to prevent genocidal acts, which was undeniably a big deal from the ICJ. Um, it's major, as you say, but the court did not call for a ceasefire mm -hmm. as requested by your petition. So that was a partial defeat for South Africa and a partial win for Israel, was it not? Well, yes, indeed. Uh, it was a disappointment, as I indicated uh, in the media uh, uh, briefing after uh, the court case. But we had anticipated that it would be very difficult for the court to issue that kind of instruction, particularly uh, given uh, the inability of the Security Council uh, to lead on this matter. But I do think uh, the fact of the provisional measures that were agreed to uh, was a very important decision uh, in, in uh, global uh, affairs. I also think uh, that had uh, those measures uh, been uh, pursued by Israel, they would require a ceasefire in order to be acted upon. You've also gone back to the ICJ to urge the court to issue emergency orders for Israel to increase humanitarian aid as a famine looms in Gaza. The Israelis have responded to the court. They've called your actions an abuse of the Genocide Convention and even morally repugnant. Uh, do you believe Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war? I think so indeed that that is happening. Uh, and it's not thought. We've seen children dying uh, from hunger and starvation. Uh, so. Yes, this is happening, and I'm not surprised. As I've said, uh, insults are the last refuge of a scoundrel. I'm being called all sorts of names. Uh, it's fine. Uh, I can be called the worst name. If we could save the lives of Palestinians, I wouldn't complain. You mentioned earlier about your experience, South Africa's experience, the history with Palestinians. Let's talk about apartheid. You were born in apartheid South Africa. Your late father, Joe Matthews, was a famous anti-apartheid activist. Do you believe that Israel is guilty of the crime of apartheid? Because Israelis often say it's offensive and disrespectful to the South Africans who struggled against apartheid to compare the Palestinians to that struggle. So it'd be interesting to ask a South African government official, what do you think about the apartheid analogy? Well, I, I respond in this way. If I cannot travel on a particular form of transport because of my nationality, um, what, what is that? Uh, I could not travel on particular forms of transport in South Africa because of my nationality. If I cannot own my land and be certain uh, that I have a freehold over it and can retain it in perpetuity uh, for generations, what is that but apartheid? If I have my land broken up into pockets which are supervised by particular authorities, and I need permits in order to enter uh, into that land. If I'm reserved in terms of movement to move within a particular corridor and have barriers placed that indicate which part of that corridor I can walk in, and as I proceed all along it, I have to produce identity documents. If I can be arrested, detained, without charge, without bail, not knowing, why I'm in a prison, uh, what wrong I have done, what else compares to this? I, I, you know, I just can't imagine if I live in ghettos, uh, like townships, and this is where I must live. Do you believe what what's happening in the West Bank and Gaza is worse than apartheid South Africa? 
I think the onslaught that we're seeing now is certainly much worse. Uh, I think it would have been difficult uh, for the world to countenance uh, that happening uh, uh, in uh, apartheid South Africa. But we had Bui Patong and many other massacres. Yes. Tomorrow we'll celebrate uh, Sharpeville, Human Rights Day. Uh, uh, well, commemorate, not celebrate. Um, so we've had terrible incidents. Uh, I don't think uh, that what is happening uh, between Israel and Palestine is absolutely complementary to the apartheid yes. experience, because a lot of it uh, is not framed in legislation. Uh, but the experience has a lot of complementarity. And uh, respected international organizations, yes, they have. which many leaders listen to, yes, have done thorough research on this question. Yes, they have, including Israeli human rights groups. You made, Minister, you made a pretty stark statement last week saying that upon their return, South Africa will arrest dual nationals uh, who have been fighting with the Israeli military in Gaza. There's even been talk from your foreign ministry in the past of stripping them of their citizenship if they're dual nationals. What law would they be violating? And won't your critics inevitably say that you are guilty of anti-Semitism for targeting your country's Jewish minority community from which these dual nationals, of course, emerge? Well, we have a law on uh, mercenary uh, activity, and it indicates that if you're a citizen of South Africa, you cannot participate in conflict uh, in another country without having approached the authorities in South Africa and provided an indication uh, that you have an intention to assist in a country and given perhaps the likelihood that this is an ally, uh, the authorities may very well grant that you are able to uh, act in that way. But without such a reference to the appropriate authority, you're actually conducting an illegal act. I can't recall the name uh, of the particular act, but we do have such an act. But you're not worried about stripping Jewish South Africans of South African citizenship? Well, I think uh, the prosecutorial authorities know the law and they have the uh, responsibility uh, to execute in this regard. Do you believe Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu should be prosecuted uh, at the ICC, at the International Criminal Court? Should he be arrested for violations of international law, for war crimes, whenever he travels abroad? I think a warrant should have been issued by now. Uh, we had made a submission to the ICC. We've not heard anything for months. But you would like to see a, an arrest warrant for Benjamin Netanyahu? I believe that the ICC needs to make a decision as to whether, in terms of war crimes, are they being committed? It's not my decision. The ICC is an appropriate authority. We wrote to it with our observations on what is happening. They must make the decision, Sim same as they did uh, with the Russian president and so, others. So you mentioned the Russian president. And earlier in the interview, you very eloquently, and in my view, rightly talked about the double standards when it comes to the West and its friends. What about your critics, South Africa's critics, who say you're guilty of double standards. You want this ICC arrest warrant for Netanyahu. Um, but when Sudanese president, former Sudanese president Omar al-Bashir visited South Africa in 2015, your country failed to arrest him, even though he was wanted at the time by the ICC for war crimes and genocide in Darfur. Last summer, your government tried to get permission from the ICC to not arrest Vladimir Putin, Russian president, when he was planning on visiting South Africa for the BRICS summit, even though there's an arrest warrant from the ICC for him. Your critics say that's a double standard on South Africa's part. Well, it's uh, plausible uh, for them to have that argument. Uh, and indeed, uh, we were very uh, uh, alert that they did approach the ICC. And uh, our anticipation was that once they had approached it on one harm, they would approach the ICC on all harm. And our observation is that that doesn't happen. Uh, with respect to al-Bashir, you know that we had a particular court ruling. And so we did approach the ICC to seek clarity as to what we do in the likelihood uh, that President Putin may come to South Africa. Our courts had a clear uh, decision. And uh, we were, you know, Having, we had to act in terms of the court decision of South Africa. Do you support the arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin? So should uh, President Putin have come, uh, we would have been in a very difficult situation and I think uh, would have had to effect uh, uh, the uh, decision of the court. Do you support the decision to put out arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin? Well, it's not whether I support or not. Well, it is, because uh, you support it for Netanyahu. I'm asking if you support uh, it for Putin. I think for any leader who commits harm against uh, innocent civilians and breaches international law, 
there should be a warrant. It's not just Vladimir Putin, is it? In January, in the same month that you went to the ICJ over Gaza, South Africa and President Ramaphosa himself hosted a man named Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, a Sudanese general, a Sudanese warlord whose militia has been accused of ethnic cleansing and war crimes, not just by the US, but by human rights groups that we just mentioned, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International. That's a pretty bad look for South Africa to be hosting a man accused of genocide in Sudan, while at the same time you're in The Hague accusing Israel of genocide. Indeed, um, uh, President, uh, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Hemeti, was in South Africa invited by a non-governmental organization uh, that is focusing on conflict resolution in Sudan and has had various iterations of meetings with the two contending groups. Uh, Mr. Hemeti, you know, he asked the NGO to request us to arrange a meeting for him with President Ramaphosa, which we did. Following that, last month, we had the Vice President of the Transitional Council of Sudan, who's on the other side. So we are talking to all parties, which is so, part of what we do as understood. South Africa. Understood. Would you, just trying to follow the logic of the argument, would you also host then Mahmoud Abbas and Benjamin Netanyahu, should he want to come to South Africa? I think that would be a difficult one for us. Yeah, for maybe, maybe uh, right now, I, I, Netanyahu I who might not want to book a flight you know, to really, Johannesburg. Uh, I doubt that. Well, they've cancelled flights to South Africa. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's just talk more broadly before we run out of time about this conflict. You, Minister, I believe, are a convert to Islam. And, and you know a lot of people see the Israel-Palestine issue through a religious prism. Uh, it's seen as through a religious prism, as Muslims versus Jews, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. How much of a problem is the religious component to this conflict, in your view, or the religious angles that people apply to it? Well, I think it's a challenge. Uh, it does blind uh, uh, people's analysis uh, and interpretation. I act in terms of uh, human rights law and by direction of our government. Uh, the decision on the ICJ wasn't mine, uh, despite the fact that my mouth is the one that speaks most on it. Uh, this was a decision of the cabinet uh, of South Africa. And as uh, the minister responsible uh, for uh, administration of the convention, I'm the public face of this. Uh, the matter of my religion uh, does not feature uh, but of course, as Muslims, uh, we always, by principle, are influenced uh, uh, by the values we live by. Uh, however, I do think um, that there is uh, an element in which uh, religion is utilized. Uh, for example, this notion that uh, by questioning uh, Israel, you're anti-Semitic. You know, this is a kind of weapon used to stop you. Uh, from challenging uh, these practices. And I think this is something uh, that we should all resist. And I have said to our community in South Africa that this is a question of human rights. And we need to, as we speak to it and support Palestinian people, uh, be clear that this is an issue of rights. I want to briefly turn towards an internal issue related to South Africa before we finish. Uh, you have right-wing people here in America including South African-born Elon Musk, who rather hysterically, even conspiratorially, claim there is a genocide of white people in South Africa. And they point to the killing of white farmers, even to the anti-apartheid era song used at the rallies of opposition party leader Julius Malema, not by the ANC, but by Malema, called Kill the Boa, uh, a term for white Afrikaners. What is your response, Minister, I'm wondering, to this increasing number of claims coming out of the US conservative movement, US right-wing media, Elon Musk, saying white genocide in South Africa? I think it's very easy to label black people uh, because we tend to see black people as having no principles and values. Uh, people uh, define themselves as very civilized and blacks as uncivilized and they expect the worst from us. None can believe that we are trying to build the most diverse uh, United Nation uh, uh, in the world that we practice uh, democracy uh, uh, very, very actively. We're a robust, open society. We have full freedom of expression, but we haven't got rid of our racism. Just two weeks ago, uh, we have a few, uh, three brothers in court for the murder of their farm workers. Uh, and little is said about that. Uh, we'd like to eradicate all such uh, racist uh, incidents, including farm murders, but all murders as well. The violence of apartheid, which many tolerated, 
uh, for decades yeah. and took very long to act upon has left a society that is in deep pain and that is scarred uh, by its history. So to uh, all of those who comment, uh, I really say, uh, you know, they're not helpful and, and there's a lot of dishonesty uh, in the statements that they make. What do you make of <clears throat> Elon Musk, who perhaps with the exception of the late Nelson Mandela is perhaps the most famous South African in the world. Um, a lot of people think he's using Twitter X <clears throat> to elevate far-right racists, anti-Semites, and others. What do you make of Musk as a South African? Well, uh, most South Africans are the children of Nelson Mandela. And uh, they try and uh, commit in their actions uh, to lifting out the best in people. And I think if you haven't had experience of Mandela, if you don't appropriate his values, uh, then your conduct uh, uh, will be most unfortunate. I don't know Mr. Musk, I can't comment on him really, I have not met him and I doubt that I ever will. Um, but uh, we would wish that wherever South Africans are, they really uh, contribute positively to society. Is he? And to building Is a he world. contributing positively in America? I don't know, but I'm saying that's what I wish okay. South Africans would do. Uh, because I believe out of our experience of a struggle against apartheid, a mighty uh, struggle where we learned values, uh, of appreciating freedom, uh, justice and rights for all. Uh, and really that human dignity was a key element yes. of what we prized. Uh, this is how we should conduct ourselves. And whenever uh, we take an action where we diminish human dignity, as South Africans, we should be worried. You're very popular abroad right now as a government. Uh, but you're not very <coughs> popular at home as a government. Uh, is that because of the state of the economy? Uh, the level of corruption, the level of murders, the rolling power cuts. Why is it that the polls are now suggesting you may, for the first time, the ANC get less than 50% of the vote? Well, firstly, I think ANC must campaign properly and very hard. Uh, I hope that we do get a majority. Uh, certainly there are concerns, there are failures uh, by uh, the ANC government. Um, I th young people are very angry about not having enough opportunities or op any opportunity at all. And certainly corruption has been a blight uh, on our uh, march uh, to, to freedom and transition. Um, we are addressing uh, corruption. President uh, Ramaphosa has been resolute in the fight and he must continue it. Um, so I, I believe South Africa, after the election, will have the African National Congress as the biggest party. And I As certainly, the party, I believe but that not necessarily uh, no, majority. we'll you get a majority. A my, my view, my belief is we'll get a, but you're not ruling a out majority. I don't support coalitions. I think they're That's a disaster. You're not ruling out a coalition. I don't support coalition. We so, must campaign for a majority. So I'll take that as you're not ruling it out. Uh, last question for you. I'd appreciate your time. When I'm in pro-Palestinian or Arab-American <clears throat> or Muslim or left-wing or young circles, and I, anyone mentioned South Africa right now, people cheer. They're happy. They see South Africa having stuck up for international justice, international law. Um, have you experienced that personally as foreign minister, this new sense of goodwill towards your country on the international stage? And if so, how do you plan to leverage that goodwill or use it going forward? I just wonder. Uh, we've always had goodwill, largely because of who we are and uh, the history uh, that we have. Uh, I think, yes, there's a, a certainly much more attention uh, on South Africa, even those who may dislike us and believe it's without merit, they whisper, you know, you, you did something important. Um, so I, I'm not sure that we should leverage it because I think that would be an abuse. Be our wrong. approach to the ICJ was a genuine uh, a step on our part, and I don't think we should use it or abuse it uh, uh, in a, a you know, deleterious uh, manner. Uh, we must continue to do our bilateral work, which is what I'm doing, uh, wherever we can, because the international uh, partnerships and diplomacy are important. I believe we live in an increasingly divided world, and I think leaders need to pause and look at how we draw the world back together to a common agenda. Minister Pandor, we will have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for appearing on Zetaya today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us.